All right. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Saturday morning, great time to be talking about your college list and a little bit more about admissions as a lot of students are getting started with uh, school and classes and, uh, you know, time starts ticking away a little bit with the admissions process. So glad that we can kind of talk a little bit now. Um, today, we've got Katie and John joining us to tell us a little bit more about how students can really uh, think through their college list a little bit more strategically or find different ways to uh, research schools and things like that. So, uh, Katie, do you mind introducing yourself and then John? Yeah, sure. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Katie Young. I'm Associate Consulting Director here at Illumin. Um, I've been working as a college counselor for about nine years now. Uh, I went to USC, got my degree in English a very long time ago, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. And um, I'm happy to be here to give you guys some advice and guidance. We have done a college list webinar before. We're going to go a little bit further this time. So hopefully this information will be valuable. Thank you, Katie. Hi, everyone. My name is John. Um, I graduated from Middlebury College with a double in history and Chinese. Um, after that, I went to China for about five, six years. And I during that, my, my work there was essentially the same I'm doing with Illumin, which is college consulting and helping students, international and American students, get into different types of colleges. Um, and yeah, I hope today that we can give you some sort of valuable information so you can get started on this process. Um, and yeah, thank you. Sir. And we've got, yeah, we've got a ton of information to go through today. So definitely I'll kind of uh, let uh, Katie and John take over. But of course, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in chat, put it in Q&A. We'll definitely get to that at the end. Okay. So uh, without further ado, Katie, you want to get, help us uh, get started here? Yeah, here goes. Um, so our agenda for today, we're going to talk uh, through a few things and I'm going to do the first half and then John's going to take over. So um, hopefully, Hopefully we can get through all of this. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about finding your best fit schools. So some strategies for that, some resources for that, balancing out your list so that it's not too full of reach schools or safe schools, so that you have a wide variety of options. Um, we're gonna go through a case study of helping a student build and refine a list. Then we're gonna move forward into prioritizing applications, sort of how, how you should, once you have your list, how you should get started and how you should make a plan for the fall. Um, we're gonna go through a case study of that. And then uh, we'll have Q&A at the end, if we miss anything, hopefully not. Um, so I'll start out with finding best fit colleges. Um, so there's a lot of methods by which we can we can build our college list. And I think the most common one, the, the one that a lot of students use is rankings lists. I think it makes sense to try rankings lists. Um, otherwise, how do you know how good is a college and, and how respected is a college? And um, I don't have a problem with rankings lists. I do want you to be able to use them in order to identify colleges for further research. But I would really caution you against building your list just because a school has a high rank. Um, I want you to be really careful and review the criteria that that list is using in order to do those rankings. Some of them are a little bit weird, a little bit shady. They weight some, some interesting things. I don't know if any of you listen to um, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast called Revisionist History, but he just did a two episode show on how the US news rankings are flawed. Go listen. Um, uh, there's old versions of lists, so every year they update it, right? And you'll notice that schools move around um, like by leaps and bounds every year. They'll go from number 20 to 40 and then back to 30. Um, so uh, don't rely necessarily on what's happening this year. Try to see if this college is always ranked where it is and then review multiple lists and compare. So maybe USC is number 23 on one list and it's 85 on another list and you wanna understand what those factors are that's putting that school there. Um, some of the common sites are listed there. Um, US News, obviously, Niche, Princeton Review, Times Higher Education, and then Forbes. Um, they're all they're all flawed in their own way and they're all helpful in their own way. I think that the one that's the easiest to search through and compare with actually for me is the Forbes list. That's my recommendation. Um, another common method that students will choose to um, do their search for colleges, oops, my computer skipped, um, is to search by statistics. So obviously you wanna understand what are your odds for getting in? What are, what are the numbers that these students are posting that are getting into these colleges? So searching by statistics is helpful, again, to identify colleges and also to filter out schools that are way too high for you. You're, you're not gonna succeed there or way too low for you. You're gonna be you know, the smartest kid in the room and maybe, maybe that's good for you, but maybe that's uncomfortable at the same time. 
Um, so there are different websites where you can enter your GPA and your test score if you have it into a search engine that will then spit out schools that are good matches for you and tell you whether they're reach target or safe. Um, Naviance is, is something that a lot of high schools subscribe to where they have sort of scattergrams, which is little dots showing the test score and GPA um, ranges of students from that particular high school who have gotten into the college, which I think is a better metric than looking at the whole country. At least you can see, you know, these are the types of students that are that I'm fighting against and where are they getting in. Um, remember the test scores are optional. So normally, um, normally test scores and GPA would both be huge factors in, in this statistical analysis. Um, this year, because testing is optional, you really can rely on your GPA. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about test optional in a minute, but um, Usually if you had like a high GPA and a low test score or vice versa, it was really hard to kind of calibrate, you know, where you should be applying at, at that point. Um, but now you don't have to worry. You just go by your GPA, it's totally fine. Um, and remember that admissions is holistic. So even if you have the high, you know, you're above the 75th percentile on GPA or test score, um, that doesn't mean you're gonna get in. They're gonna look at a lot of other factors and compare you to students in a lot of different ways in order to decide if you should have that spot. So you can search by rankings and statistics. These are the more, I guess, like concrete, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Evidentiary searches. A lot of the other ways to search are pretty subjective. I'm gonna go through those in a second. Okay. Um, so another way to search is by major. I know a lot of students are undeclared and that's totally okay. You can just choose a college that you love and apply to a major that's interesting there. Don't worry about it. But if you already know what you wanna study, this is a good way again to refine some options or to get started. Like if you just look up best colleges, there's tons and tons of things. But if you look up best colleges for psychology, that'll be a totally different list of schools. Um, QS is, is a ranking system that goes major by major and it's actually the whole world um, full of colleges. So you can look up colleges in Asia or Australia or Canada on that website too, which usually doesn't come to mind, I think, for a lot of my students. Um, US News, Poets and Quants, they have um, different lists for different, different majors. So again, cross-checking, seeing where schools, schools end up on these different lists. Um, you can also find which colleges offer your major. Let's say you want to study something a little bit more obscure, like exercise science, food science. You can go on Big Future, which is a college board website, search up your major and find colleges that offer that major. That'll help you refine, um, refine your options a little bit more. And then lastly, if you're looking by major, a lot of my students will come in and say like, I wanna go to Stanford and study business. Business is not an undergraduate major at Stanford. They only have MBA programs for business. So you need to be careful. Are you looking at graduate programs, MBA, master's programs? Or are you looking at undergraduate programs that you can enroll in right now? Um, if you can't find a rankings list for an undergraduate program, check out the graduate programs, right? Like if they, if a school has a really strong computer science master's, the likelihood is those, those faculty members are teaching undergraduate classes too, or involved in some way. So you can use that as an indicator, but don't rely. Don't rely on graduate rankings to tell you the quality of a program. I'm talking fast, John, is there anything to add? No, you're doing well, you're doing well. Good, all right. Um, another method I think students kind of um, have been asking me about a little bit more lately is cost um, and how to sort of search for colleges by affordability. Um, a lot, of, a lot of students that come to Illumin are looking mostly not at need-based aid, but merit-based aid. So the, the conversation I'm, I'm having right now is around both, um, but I'll talk about merit aid in a second. Um, net price calculators are tools on every single college's website. They have to have one. It's, it's sort of a policy at this point from the Department of Education. So if you Google like Gonzaga net price calculator, you'll find this, you enter some basic information about your family and income, and it will tell you what you're likely sticker price is gonna be for that school without you ever filling out the FAFSA or any other documents. So you can get an idea. If your family's income is $50,000, the tuition there is more than $50,000 a year, like what is that really gonna look like for you in terms of cost? It's kind of hard to tell um, without this. If you don't feel like entering that information, you can go to a website called College Scorecard, which is a government website, and you can look up each individual college, scroll down, and you can see the net price by income level. Um, written right there. Feel free to screenshot these slides, by the way, and I can always put links in the chat at the end if anybody has questions. Um, there's also a cool system called the Western University Exchange, where California, Washington, Oregon, Hawaii, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, 
maybe Colorado, um, are part of this network of colleges where if I live in California, but I go to one of these colleges in Colorado, I can get in-state tuition for that college in Colorado. So it makes it a lot cheaper. Um, a lot of colleges are not part of this, but if you can find one that is part of this program, it's a really great deal. Um, so you're not limited to California public colleges. UCs are very competitive, but you want that price, take a look at Western University Exchange. Um, Honors programs are a great way to be eligible for merit-based scholarships. So maybe a safer school, let's say like Arizona State, Ohio State would be a safe school for a lot of my students. Joining their honors program will make you eligible for a lot of merit-based money. So merit-based money is money you don't need, but they love you and they wanna give it to you so that you'll come to their school. So applying to honors programs can get you there. Um, and then there are colleges with the highest merit aid, which I'm gonna show you on the next page. Um, but please note that if you want to apply for merit aid, you have to walk through the financial aid process. You still have to do the FAFSA. You still have to fill out the materials. And John will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so more than 40, if you're looking at merit-based colleges, more than 40% of students at these colleges get merit-based aid. Give you guys a second to do a screenshot. Um, this is just a list I found on US News. You guys can probably find it pretty easily, but some surprising schools there. Some schools you wouldn't think of as like super, super rich schools are giving out a lot of money. Five, four, three, two. Okay, um, so now we're gonna go through some uncommon methods for searching for colleges. I think these are different approaches. For those of you who came to our admissions trends webinar, you'll recognize some of these slides, but I think these are pretty important. Um, I'm gonna pop through them a little bit fast just because um, you can take a screenshot if you really want. And also the source for all my information is at the bottom of the page if you wanna Google it. So if you're looking at colleges and you're thinking like, I don't really care where I go, I just wanna make sure I get a job when I get out. What are, so what are the factors that different employers are really looking for? And this was a survey that was conducted um, a few years ago of a lot of top 500, um, like Forbes 500 companies. And they mentioned internships and employment during college were two of the biggest factors that they considered when they were looking at hiring. So if we wanna make sure we go to a college where we can get internships and get jobs during college, we wanna look at colleges with internships and co-ops. Co-ops are essentially semesters that you take during your college experience where you work, you get a job in a company and you're actually working, you're getting professional experience. So these are the colleges that have the best internship and co-op opportunities. So if you're looking at rankings overall, you're probably not gonna get these schools coming out at the top. If you're looking for colleges with great internship opportunities so that you can build your resume so that you can get a job, here you go. Okay. Next up, um, if you're planning on grad school, if you're planning on medical school, law school, there's definitely some things that you need to do during your undergraduate years in order to, to get there, to get to the level where you're going to get handpicked by these grad programs. So for medical school, according to the Association of American Medical Colleges, they're looking a lot at GPA and your courses. They're looking a lot at your test scores, which is, you know, something that you can take regardless of where you go to college, the GRE, the LSAT, and then letters of rec from professors. So if we just look at those two things, the GPA, the letters of rec, the other ones are more like personal qualities, right? And then the test score, which is not really something we can control for. So the two things that we can control for when we search for a college would be how easy is it to get a good GPA and get the courses that you want? And how easy is it to get strong letters of recommendation? So in that case, let's look at the best undergraduate teaching. So if we're looking at colleges that have the best academic atmosphere, the best professors, we're looking at these colleges, which again, might not show up to you if you're looking at just a normal overall rankings list. Some surprises on there actually for me. Big public schools are not like usually known for having strong um, professors, strong teaching. So I was excited to see University of Maryland and um, Arizona State on there. Um, another uncommon method, I just want to make money. Um, so go to a college where they produce the highest paid graduates. These are them. Um, I think if you really take a close look at these, you'll notice like Harvey Mudd, Stevens, Colorado School of Mines, Maritime, Pharmacy Health Sciences. These are schools that are geared towards specific career pathways, right? Like medicine, engineering. Um, so obviously these students are gonna make the most money, but if you visit Payscale, which is the, the link where I got this information, you can actually search highest paid graduates by major. So you can go and see like psychology majors, where are the highest paid psychology majors going to school? 
So don't worry about this. But I, again, I thought this was fun. Um, some schools you would never otherwise see. I've never heard of SUNY Maritime before. In my life. Um, okay, so you've built your list. You've used some common methods, some uncommon methods. You have a lot of schools you want to apply to. Usually my students come in with like 50, 35. Um, now we're going to work on balancing and refining that list. So how do we do that? Um, first of all, oops, see it keeps doing that. All right, how many colleges should I apply to? So um, you're gonna have a few factors to consider when you think about this. One is limits imposed by your high school. Some high school counselors or teachers will not, will not allow letters for more than a certain number of schools. Um, my student last year, her English teacher said, I'll only do 15 schools. And that was, that was the limit that she decided to stick to. Um, limits on application platforms. So the Common App, yeah, John, do you want to say something? No, not at all. Oh, okay. Um, limits on common, on platforms. So the Common App um, hosts about 900 colleges, but they only let you apply to 20. Um, so you have to be pretty selective with the schools that, that you're choosing. Um, cost is important to consider here. Each application is gonna cost you between 50 and 100 bucks. So. Well, plus if you send your test scores, that's another $12 per college, it racks up. So if you're applying to like 30 colleges, you better like kiss your mother's feet because that's a lot. And then workload um, obviously is something to consider. So my students will come in with ambitious lists and then I'll show them all the essay prompts and they'll be like, never mind. Um, so take a look at all the work that you're gonna have to do and make sure that it's feasible considering your senior schedule and everything else that you have going on. Can you really write 30 essays in three months? I don't think so. Um, our advice is to stick to 12 to 15 schools. Um, no fewer than 10. Um, I think fewer than 10, you're really setting yourself up for not having a lot of choice um, when you get to the spring, when you get all your results back. My goal for my students is to have choices of where they go so they don't feel like they have to choose like path one or path two. They have lots of different ideas and they can compare and contrast and visit and check it out. More than 20 is just too much. You're not, you're not paying enough attention. You, you don't have enough factors that you're considering on your list. You need to bring in some more criteria and narrow it down. So like, does it rain there all the time? Take it off the list, right? Um, how do I determine whether a school is reach target and safe and how do we really define that? I think if you talk to any counselor, any company on the planet, they're going to have a different definition for this. This is just the one that, that we tend to stick to. Um, so dream schools, our colleges are hard for everyone to get into. They have less than a 15% acceptance rate. Some of them have 4% acceptance rates, 5% acceptance rate. So a school is dream for you if it has this very low acceptance rate and or your grades and scores are well below the averages. So if you're looking at Stanford, which has a 4% acceptance rate, and their average GPA is 3.9 and yours is 3.3. This is a dream school for you. Reach schools or colleges you might get into, but they're just still a little bit of a risk. So 15 to 30% acceptance rate would be generally defined as a reach school. And then your grades and scores are still below the averages. So maybe they're, they're in the middle, but but close to the bottom. And remember, you can just use your grades. If your test score is low, don't hold yourself back from applying to schools this year. This is your shot. You guys are lucky in a lot of ways and unlucky in many more ways, but this is one small way in which you're lucky that you don't have to worry about the test score stuff. Um, so if you're not happy with theirs, just rely on your GPA. Target schools for us have not for us, for you, if you're looking at schools, if they have a 30 to 60% acceptance rate and your scores are on average or just above, just below average, this is a target school for you. And I'll do these little mini categories that are like reach slash target because it's kind of in the middle. Um, and I, I think that gets a little complicated. So we'll just call that a target. And then safety is a college you will almost definitely get into. I would no, not call a college safe for someone unless I was like 100% sure that they were gonna get in. So a 60% acceptance rate and or, and or your grades and scores are above or far above the averages. Okay. So other factors affecting your admission. So those statistics, those percentages, the acceptance rate, the GPA, the test score, those are just the baseline. And then we've got to pull it up or pull it down depending on some other factors. So let's say that a school was target for you based on your GPA and based on their acceptance rate. Now, if you're looking at your high school graduating class, are you in the top 10%, 25%, 50%? Um, a lot of high schools don't rank, so it's hard to tell. But if you look at different colleges, they, they don't really share the GPA of their applicants, but they share their class rank. 
So for Harvard, for example, I don't know why I'm using such top tier schools. Sorry, everyone. But for Harvard, they say like 98% of their admitted students are in the top 10% of their class, something like that. So it's important to know where you're at. Even if your GPA is good, if you're, there's people at your school that are better, you might need to pull your, your chances back and call this more of a reach school than a target school. Um, In-state versus out-of-state. So at being here, applying to the UCs, you have an advantage as a California student. They accept a higher net proportion of California students. If you're trying to apply to an out-of-state school like UW or University or UT Austin, um, you're going to have a harder time. So if you look up UT Austin, it says it has like a 50%, something like that acceptance rate, but actually their out-of-state acceptance rate is closer to 10%. And UW released their computer science statistics, which is one of the scariest things I've ever seen. Um, for out-of-state applicants, it's around 4% now. So you have to look a little closer, try to find that information. It's not available for all schools. But again, if UW was a target for me, but I was applying for computer science, now it's a reach, right? Way too low of an acceptance rate for me to call that a target. Um, consider the popularity of the college. If the college, like if you're looking around and every single one of your friends is applying to this school, your odds are lower. You're getting directly compared to all of those people. So try to choose schools that nobody else has heard of or nobody else is looking at. And then they're gonna look at your resume. They're gonna look at your subjective factors like your teacher recommendations, your essays. And then of course your major is a big one which we're gonna talk about in more detail. There, there is one thing I, I do want to add for this. Um, I recently had a sort of a, a meeting with a client and they had mentioned that their child's school don't they don't have a lot of resources when it comes to, uh, to AP exams. Hmm. Right. So and they were a little concerned with how other schools who have more privileges and more resources, how they might compare it because a student from, from that school might have 10 different sort of AP exams. I would say that it's it's sort of in how admissions officers re, will look at this is that they'll look at your uh, child's standing within your school. They understand that not all schools are equal. Not all schools have the same amount of resources and so on. So it's okay to not sort of stress that out so much where you will feel like your son or, or daughter, they don't have a, a chance of getting into a certain school because they're competing with other schools in that sort of same location. So um, they do look at your school first, your class ranking, as Katie just said, and that's mm -hmm. what's important and how, and how challenging the courses that your child is taking in that school. Mm -hmm. Context, they're, they're mm -hmm. gonna evaluate you within context. Um, and that's what I mean when I'm, I'm saying here too, the extracurricular resume. If, if you're at a school where everybody just like goes to school and goes home and you're the president of like 16 clubs and you play four sports, obviously your resume is going to stand out compared to other people from your school. If you're that kid who goes home, right? Again, so we're just, we, we take the original list with the stats and then we are gonna add the context of all of this stuff, including the high school. Thanks for that point, John. Um, and then we're gonna calibrate the list from there. So it, it's surprising to students and families sometimes when they see that I'll put a school as a reach school that they were expecting to be a target school. So these are some of the reasons why I might do that. Um, the big one is major. So within California, we've got the UCs, the CSU campuses. Um, they're full, they're impacted, they're capped. What that means is they have to put additional criteria onto students who apply to those majors versus students who apply to the school in general. So if you're applying to be a philosophy major or an anthropology major or a creative writing major, you're probably not gonna run into the issues that a computer science or an engineering or a pre-medical student is gonna run into in admissions. So strategizing around major will also bring your admissions chances up or down. So when we talk about majors, um, one of the statistics that really just like blew my mind last year was at UC Irvine. This was an article that was in, I believe, the LA Times. UC Irvine said that 50% of their applicants selected six majors. So they there's 85 majors there and 50% of the kids who applied only applied to six of those majors. So of course not all those students were able to get in. They don't have that much room in those majors. And people will say, well, why don't they just increase the size of the program? They're trying, they're doing that incrementally, right? But they're, they're trying to keep other departments going, other departments full, other professors employed, other research going on. So they have to, they have to consider a lot of other factors versus just how many students wanna get in. And if they increase their admission rate, then that's will go down on the rankings list you guys this is the uh this is the mind trick that they're playing with you so they want to keep it difficult to get in so that they'll be sought after so that they will remain popular and remain cool on the rankings list so it's pretty mean point is pick a major that not all your friends are picking pick a major that's not obvious um i think people have sort of this like 
you know, I've taken biology, biology is my major, when there's like 15 different types of biology that you could choose from and get around a lot of the crowd. So just take a closer look at the majors being offered and try to pick something that's more unique. Um, do, do you know which majors, which of the six majors? That they yeah, have? it was um, biology, psychology, nursing, computer science, business, and actually the last one was undeclared. Undeclared, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so those are always like tippy top. I, I was surprised that engineering actually didn't, didn't get into this. I think um, usually at a UC, engineering would be the most popular. I guess at Irvine, they have, you know, slightly more like liberal artsy, social science-y um, majors that are getting applied to. Um, always put a second choice major. Everyone thinks like, but if I put a second choice, they'll put me in there. No, they'll consider you for your first choice first. And if you're not right for it, they'll consider you for your second choice. It's not, you're not sabotaging yourself by giving yourself a second look. They're gonna look at you again. Um, different, the, one thing we noticed last year in the admissions trends, and we mentioned this, you guys can find that webinar, by the way, on our on our website. I'm sure Anthony will put a link in the chat. Um, but we did a webinar about different trends we noticed in admissions. And one of them was that students who differentiated themselves by showing overlapping interests. So like, uh, I'm interested in psychology, and I'm interested in computers. And how am I going to combine, combine, combine those two things into sort of like a future goal or a future career? those students stood out. They had really interesting resumes, really interesting ideas in their essays um, that I that I think helped versus mm -hmm. just like, I am very skilled at computer science. Just something to think about. Um, and then show some direction. I, I'm fine with people picking undeclared. I get it, you're 17, you don't know, you're not sure, but you're interested in something. Um, so think, look at your resume, look at the classes that you selected, right? Try to think like, where could this lead me to? What article did I read lately that was interesting? Um, applying undeclared is not a strategy. Um, it, it's, it's something you should do if you really are not sure. Um, but it's not gonna make your chances any better as we just noticed at UC Irvine with a billion students applying undeclared. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would also add for the undeclared um, sort of major strategy here. A lot of students, they would sort of think about, cause they don't really understand, as you said, they're young, not really sure what they wanted to sort of uh, mm -hmm. pursue. But when you're doing, but when you're, when you have your, your college list and you're doing, you're dealing with those essays, many colleges are gonna ask you, what major are you interested in? and why right so if you pick undeclared you do want to highlight the two to three different sort of um aspects of your interests and hobbies that you do want to explore in school so just because you don't know what your path you want to take as a major you should still sort of really talk about different ideas and disciplines that you do want to potentially pursue totally all right so um, I said we were going to talk about this a little bit. I don't have too much to say. I just wanted to clarify the test optional test blind thing. So a lot of schools this year are optional, which means if you submit it, they will consider it. If you omit it, they will not. It is not a disadvantage to not submit a test score. Um, it, it's supposed to move testing. Usually what it would be is like GPA and test score are here and then all the other factors are here. Now GPA or academic profile is here and testing just becomes one of those other factors that's, mm -hmm. that's on your resume. It's like a resume item. So you can think of it as like an award that you won. You can think of it as like a score on USACO or Amy or you know any of those other types of tests that are not admissions tests. Um, so if you feel like your score is strong compared to the averages at the school from past years, submit it. It can only help you. It's not going to hurt you. If you feel like your score is well below and you, you don't think it represents your best abilities and your best chances to get into the school, don't send it. It's really no problem. There are a lot of schools, not a lot, a couple schools that are going to be test blind this year, meaning they're not going to look at scores even if you send them. And the UCs are one of those systems that, that is going test blind this year. So if you have more questions about that, let us know. We can do some Q&A on that at the end. And then yeah, I just wanted to kind of give an example. Submitting a score is not an advantage unless it's a strong score. So being a member of DECA is great. Put that on your resume. There's no problem with that. You're not going to get like points taken away for being in DECA, but you are going to get points added for being a DECA international champion. So I, I want to just put test scores in sort of that mindset, put them in the mindset of like an activity versus a grade. Okay. That's my, that's what I've, I don't know if John agrees with that, that's what I've been saying. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, I make sense sometimes. Um, and then, yeah, back to the list. So we, we were just talking about how, like, how do you decide what's a reach target in safety? How do you kind of calibrate and move things around? So now that you've kind of 
placed in your head, like, okay, these are my targets, these are my reaches, these are my safeties, how many of each should you have? So the majority of your school should be in that target category. Um, the reason for that, again, is to give yourself as many options as possible, give you a flexible choice in the spring, and also maximizes your effort. If you're spending days and days and hours and hours working on only reach and dream schools, you're not going to get a huge payoff here. So make sure that you're focusing your time and energy well. Um, your list should look like a bell curve. So try to just put the majority of targets and then everything else on the sides. Um, this is flexible. Um, you can have, if you're a really stellar student, you're top tier, like you're, you're in range for you know, the top 10 schools, you can have more reaches and fewer safeties. We know you're gonna be okay. If you're a student who's a little bit lower you know, and is concerned, pad yourself with safeties. It's really not a problem to apply to safeties most of the time because they don't require a lot of extra work. It's mostly just submitting an application form. Um, mm -hmm. So I would recommend you pad yourself with some safety schools and do, do your Hail Marys, do your dream schools, but just don't make that your focus. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom. I'm sorry, I know I'm taking way too much time. So um, this is a case study of a student that I, I helped with college list. I just want you to kind of see what our conversation was like and where we started and where we ended up. So this is, um, this is a student, this is a real student, but I've changed a lot of the details. So hopefully they don't know I'm talking about them. Hi, um, 3.9, 1490 um, test score wants to go into engineering. Their activities resume, I asked, you know, I asked for usually like top three, top five activities, um, music, tutoring, um, sports, robotics, and then there was a research project this past summer. Um, the students' preferences were to be on the West or East Coast, go to a large college, focus on undergraduate research, possibly minor in music, and then be surrounded by some fun and outgoing and driven students. So when this family first came in, they brought me this list. This was their original list that they came in with. Um, and my assessment of that list is on the left. So I was letting them know that I felt that their list was way too top heavy, meaning all those colleges that are orange have less than a 20% acceptance rate to start with. And um, when I was looking at the student's resume, like of course the GPA is great, but they're going for engineering. So that's a little bit scary. And then their resume doesn't have a lot of like shiny, happy, fancy, things on it. Um, so I was a bit worried that this was this was top heavy for them. Um, additionally, they do have some UCs on there, but um, STEM, STEM majors are really impacted at the UCs. And then there's Cal Poly. So I was worried about the students' chances there. Um, public colleges out of state uh, have a lower percent of students from here, and they have more restrictions on STEM. So that took out things like um, yeah, case what uh, UIUC, you know, couldn't really be a target school necessarily for them for that reason. Um, and then I noticed there was only one really true safe, safe school on here, and that was Arizona State. So I felt that that this list was just way out of balance. Um, so the factors I looked at, again, were just like the GPA, the resume not being focused and the major being competitive. And then I feel like this is a typical list. Um, that a student will bring in, especially a STEM student, because again, they're, they're looking at their friends and their family and their cousins, and they're looking at the internet and they're seeing that these are the high ranked schools. So they're picking them and that's fine. I'm not gonna deter anybody from this list, but what I did help this student with was updating it and refining it. So um, we got way down in terms of the number of schools. So now we have 19 colleges, but 15 applications, which is still in that sort of 12 to 15 range that, that I am trying to target with my students. So now they're only working on 15 apps instead of 20. Um, we kept some of those orange schools, but we added in some safeties. So the green ones are the safeties. Um, they were already going to do Cal Poly, which is on the Cal State application platform. So I suggested adding like San Jose State to that to, to give them a safe option. Um, Ohio State, Arizona. We removed a lot of the Ivies, um, you know, after looking at the profile and realizing also those are just Ivies. They don't actually have that strong of engineering programs. Um, so we, we took some of those out, but left the one that he really loved, which was Johns Hopkins. Um, I added some additional options sort of through the middle, which are, are kind of down here, um, the UIUC through Wisconsin options. Um, I advised the student to apply early to some of these out-of-state programs to make sure they got priority consideration. And then again, my goal is to make sure they have choices. So I think that any of these schools in white um, could potentially be targets verging on reaches for this student. The green ones are safe and then the orange ones are, are the big reaches. So I can bring this slide back at the end, but for now I'm going to go ahead and move on to John. Yeah, I do have a question for, for that last one. Given today's yeah. sort of environment where a lot of test, 
tests are optional and blind, would you have your, if you had the student again this year, would you have them, would you recommend them, recommend them to submit that 1490 SAT score? The 1490 score for engineering, I do think is a bit low. So I, I don't have it in front of me, but I would say if they had already, mm -hmm. like let's say AP scores in physics and calculus or right. you know, things like that, I would say they probably don't need to bother um, to turn in the test score because those scores will prove you know, their mathematical ability, which is really the important thing here. A 1490 is not bad in any universe at all. Um, mm -hmm. So most of these schools, like I would say Wisconsin, Case Western, UIUC, Santa Clara, Arizona, I would turn it in. Um, I would probably avoid turning it into Johns Hopkins, George Tech. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, can you, you have access to this. Can you click the next slide as well? Okay, so um, so Katie just went over how to sort of build a school list, and given our time, we do want to give enough time for Q and A, which um, I, I'm sure a lot of you have um, questions about particular cases. So I'll try to speed this through a little faster um, than I was planning for. So I think once you have that initial school list of 15 schools, let's say 10 or 15 schools, which we recommend. I think to, to start that, I think you should start with the UC essays. Now the UC essays, and we do have an upcoming um, webinar seminar about the UC essays um, that, that they're gonna go into much more depth in, that, that I will today, but typically there are four different essays that you can pick from the UCs. We recommend that one, two of the essays can, should be anything that has to do with major interest and community. The other two that I would typically recommend for students will be creativity or leadership. Now, the last two essays that you decide to pick of the eight UC prompts is up to you, right? And this is something that you can talk with your consultant about to see what matches, right? The reason why we do recommend students start with the UC essays, even though the deadline for UC, the University of California system is no November 30th, is because a lot of these essays can be adapted and reused for other schools in the future. So this saves a ton of time. Right. If you have if you're starting now and you have a, a list of 10 to 15 different schools, and you have 30 or so essays, then this starting with this can save you a ton of time, which is great for for stress, manage stress and any any activities and tests that your school might have for you. Um, so when you're when you're searching your school, point number two, searching your school list to see what matches, I think a good sort of plan to sort of do is to categorize all of your, once you have your school list, you categorize the essays that the schools are asking. The essays can be why major, why are you interested in this particular major, if it's engineering, business, sociology, or psychology, why do you want to do this, and what do you see yourself doing in the future? So that's one category. Another category can be why us, may, um, uh, essay which is asking you why are you interested in a particular school or program right and in other categories what you see here in, in the first point with the ucs can be leadership essays creativity and community right so once you have all these different categories then you can start knocking those different those uh, those essays that are asking the same type of question over and over again so all of a sudden schools or school lists with 10 different as you see here in point number three with 10 different or 25 different essays you can cut that down to maybe half if you categorize well and you plan it in, in, in advance um other uh, another essay uh, that i'm sure everyone's heard about is the common app personal statement which is the largest essay that you're, you're probably going to do um and this essay is sent to to every single um school that you're applying to in the common app application system right um i would say that in order to sort of complete this i think one week before early decision and early action deadline is fine typically and i'll tell you um in the next slide next few slides when those deadlines are but typically november anywhere from november 15th to december 1st you have that edea deadline um for different schools the deadlines and dates vary right so having having um a completing the uc essays first followed by the common app person statement can give you sort of um can really help you manage a lot of these essays. Um, so I would say that for EDEA schools, early decision one, there's early, there's two different early decisions, one and two. Typically um, early decision one is November 1st. Um, that's what most schools typically go for. And then early decision two is anywhere from, um, between January 1st to January 15th, right? Depends on the type of school. I would say uh, applying to one of those schools and then applying to at least three EA schools is a good, is uh, if you have a school list of 12, is a good sort of um, starting point to have. 
right? You could do more EAs, you could do less, it's up to you and your consultant for how many you want to do and how much time you have in order to complete this. But starting now in August, September, I think you have enough time to complete these four different schools. And this is also in addition to UC uh, um, schools and essays. Um, for which school, for which ED school you should apply for early decision, you should, I think you should apply for the school that you really, really want to get into or, or more difficult schools, because it does increase your odds by at least 10 to 12%, depending on the school that you're applying for. So this is a good strategy to, to utilize. The only thing with ED is that you have to go to that school if you do get accepted. Um, okay, next slide. Thank you, Katie. Um, some reach applications, I, we, one of the reasons we also mentioned to have a, a bell curve for your list, meaning if you have 10 schools, you have maybe two to three reach and so on, it's because these reach schools do require a lot of effort and a lot of essay writing. Brown University, University of Chicago, oftentimes these type of reach types of schools, they'll ask really obscure or random questions that are really fun to write about, but they have no connection with any other schools. So we can't utilize those essays for other schools, right? So we have to really put all our effort. If you have University of Chicago, Brown, Notre Dame, University of Michigan, Wake Forest, these type of schools require more effort than other schools because they can't really be adapted to other essays. So really understanding if what your what essay requirement your list has can really help prepare you in the future too. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here, the, I, as I mentioned before in the first slide, the major deadlines to consider EDEA, this is early action, early, um, early decision. Early action, there's really no difference between um, regular decisions. So it's just you applying early and getting that decision back early. There's really no advantage there. Um, the dates can range from October 15th to December 1st. Most of the schools are November 1st, right? So it's a good idea to get more, um, all your first ED and all three um, EA um, schools essays done before November 1st, and then you should have um, your UC essays completed by this month, next month too. And that gives you November and December to focus on the other schools on your essay as you're continuously applying more and more once you submit these essays and schools. As right here, UC essays on November 30th. Um, rolling admissions, for rolling admissions, you, the difference between rolling admissions and regular decision or any other type of uh, application status is that once you submit the, the, uh, the applications that you submit is when the school starts to take you into consideration and you can, and typically those deadlines are longer. For example, Penn State has rolling admissions um, status, but some, but I would really implore everyone to do research into their school list because even if a school has rolling admissions for just for most of the departments, schools like Penn State, their nursing program and their pre-med track, they typically have deadlines for that. So just because the school is rolling admissions doesn't mean that you can just wait on that. You have to really research and understand what program you're, you're applying to. And if that has a different deadline from the regular deadlines that a Common App or the school has to offer, right? It's really important to do that research. Um, and again, with the regular deadline is January 1st, there's different types of dates for that. Not all schools are, are deadline January 1st. Some schools are January 2nd, January 5th, and a lot of the liberal arts colleges here in the last point, a lot of those schools are January 15th and so. So, um, so really considering when your schools, the deadlines are, can really help you plan in a, a, a ahead for these different schools. Next slide, please. Katie, am I going too fast? No? Okay, good. Um, no, it's my fault. <laughs> um, I think you could slow down a little bit. Like, we still have okay. a few minutes, so I think yeah. you're Well, your, 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 your information was, was um, more relevant than what I'm saying here. Um, but for the interviews, there's other deadlines to really consider. For financial aid, the application process for that opens between October and February. And this is also something that for different schools, they have different very uh, different dates for that. So really considering, um, I think once you have that school list, the first thing you should do after that school list is start to categorize your essays, understand what essays can be used in multiple things, and start to categorize the different dates of importance. For financial aid is one of them, interviews is another one, right? For Cornell Architecture Program, I had a student who applied to this program last year, she had to spend weeks in preparation for this for this architecture program internship because it's for um for a uh, not internship interviews because they do put a lot of weight into that type of interview especially for a school of, of hotel administration our program so it took us a several two weeks of preparation she was a student whose um, english ability wasn't the best but her passion for this was so we had to really understand how we can leverage her language ability to express her ideas and be more specific to that program. So understanding the different types of requirements for interviews, financial aid, um, the deadlines for early action and, and early decision and rolling missions is gonna help you prioritize which essays and tools you should apply to first. Okay, next slide. Okay, 
Um, I, this is this is sort of a rehash of a lot of information I just said earlier, so we can sort of skip this in, in the um, effort of time. But I think I, I do want to sort of bring your eyes here in the second point. Where can you find this information in an easy to read sort of document? If you in the first um, point here in the Common App website, which is the website, the, the application system that you're going to use for most of your schools. If you go to the search section of when you're searching for different schools to add to your application, in the top right corner, you're going to see something called um, application requirements. Once you click on that, you can see a list of all the schools that Common App has to offer. I think there's like 950 school, different schools that you can that you can go through. And once you search for your schools, it will tell you all of the, the major deadlines. It will tell you the major the deadlines for EA, for for ED. It will tell you the for for if your school requires an interview or not. It will tell you if it requires different testing, the, te the testing status, and when you should apply to the. This, these different types of programs. So this is a great resource to use that if you have a list of 10 schools now, you can start your college app um, application and get this information in a PDF and that's gonna help you as well. Okay, next. Okay, so this um, this is a, a case study. I think um, we have a few more slides and we can get into Q&A, but this is a, a case study that I think is slightly different from the case study that um, Katie just mentioned. This is a student that I helped uh, last year get into uh, UPenn, University of Pennsylvania M&T program, which is a really difficult program to get into, especially for a student who is interested in computer science. Um, as we mentioned earlier, if you think about UC Irvine, the top university, the top major for that was major, was, um, their business and their computer science, right? So if you imagine combining these two, it's, it's just even more uh, difficulty to get into this. So we have to plan well in advance. So this is a type of school, if you have a dream school like this or a school that requires a lot of uh, sort of is more difficult to get into than your sort of average school on your list, then I think starting with this school first is key, right? So for her, this is her sort of profile here. She was interested in computer science business, but her major activities were uh, robotics, Model U United Nations, my MUN, and uh, virtual, re um, virtual reality VR internship program, which is going to be something that we really leaned on when it came to her different type of Y major essays, right? This is something that she put most of her effort on and we wrote about and she used in her, in her interview process later on to describe her passion for this, for computer science, right? Um, her main problem here, and I think a lot of um, some students who, um, she could have easily went for undeclared because she had a lot of different interests in, in several different activities, model UN community service, dance, um, backlighting crew for theater. She had uh, she was interested in multiple different Red Cross uh, charities and robotics. So there was a wide sort of range of, of activities that she that she was following, but that was the issue that we had it was she had too many things to write about right or too many things to or too many activities that she had so our main goal to fix this or help her was to combine multiple different aspects of her of her activities list so that we have different different um, disciplines that we can talk about and use that in her essays so what we did was that we combined robot uh, virtual reality robotics and community service to to build a product that I'll talk about a little bit later um, that you can see how we leverage that that project in order to help her get into UPenn m and Go ahead, next slide. Okay, so this is this is the sort of taking everything that that uh, Katie said and what I just mentioned too. how do I, how do we use how do we follow the different steps to help this particular case. For Jenny's progression, we first built that school list, as I mentioned earlier, building a school list of, for her, she was 15 schools or so. Um, she didn't follow the bell curve, um, but she did follow is that her school was more top heavy, and this is what she insisted. Her and her mother insisted that we follow this, and that gave us a lot more effort and work um, in, in um, throughout, throughout. So first, we, what we did, we categorized all of her essays, right? We found that UCs was, uh, for the UCs, we found that her community Essay, her Y major essay, and her leadership essay was going to be the essays that we're going to that we had to polish as soon as possible in order to apply that to her UPenn essays later on because they asked very similar questions. UPenn asked very similar questions when it came to community, when it came to how she used her leadership experience to help other groups in need, and that's what we did to 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 sort of prepare her for these different types of essays um, and pathway there. So starting with the UC first, after we categorize all her essays later on. Once we categorized those essays, it was much easier for me and her to spot any of her weaknesses, right? We noticed that of her 15 schools, maybe 40% of those schools, 40 to 50% of those schools were, were Y major and community essays, 
right? They asked those questions over and over again. So with her, I knew that her community essay, um, when she had a lot of different types of community service, but not really much that had to do with engineering and business, which is what the major, which is what um, UPenn MNT program management technology was asking for her for. Um, that program combined Wharton School and UPenn engineering together to see what school, how students can use business and engineering to excel. For her, she had a lot of interest with, with engineering, a lot of interest with, um, with um, business, but not many when combining those two. So for that month of August and September, what we did is that we decided to brainstorm a project because we knew those were the different types of essays that were gonna give her the most obstacles in the future that we had to answer and find some, some, some sort of way to combine her different interests in order to prepare for that particular essay. This was something that we can foresee after we categorize and plan everything together, right? For her, I, I knew we had to find something to combine engineering and business. So one a brainstorm acti um, activity that we did was we combined virtual reality to something she's been dealing with and psychology. She was in a program in robotics where she helped uh, outreach students sort of um, deal, uh, build Lego robotic kits. But during that time, she noticed that a lot of her students had anger management issues or emotional um, instability. So what she decided to do was to build a product using virtual reality, using cheap headsets, to, that are really affordable to build a sort of psycho, um, psychologist type of ther therapeutic room to help those students deal with that sort of um, emotional instability, right? After that, we knew from her essays that were coming up that her, one of the UC, um, one of her UPenn essays were gonna ask how she used her products or her skills to help a community, right? And I knew, okay, so we have business and engineering. So we decided that uh, the next step to that, pro that activity or project was to, um, present her her virtual reality product to different schools, different middle schools in her region in North Carolina, right, where she, the student um, went to uh, to high school. So now we have a product, we have a product of a process line, and we had the ability to sort of demonstrate that and give back to the community. So now, because we were able to pl plan in advance, we had all her UPenn essays completed. Right. Another thing that I think you can do with your 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 um, kid is to sort of look at is to work backward. So in order for for, for uh, Jenny, what we did is that we looked at UPenn's. Um, they literally tell you what type of student they're looking for. If you go to UPenn About Us section, and you can go to every school section, not just UPenn or I release, you can go to every About Us section, and they'll tell you we're we're a school. We're looking for school for children or for students who are. Um, in a close-knit community, entrepreneurship in, in personality and innovative, right? So we had to, so for Jenny, we had to highlight those three, those three um, different qualities in order to make her a close fit to that program as possible, right? So you can think about any other school and you look at your school list, look at the about us section on the website and they'll tell you what the school philosophy is, what they're looking for and you can plan in advance how you're going to answer those questions to, to cater to that a little more. Um, the third point of this of here and in, in the interview process, um, for the interview pro interview process, that became a lot easier once we were able to write the why us essay, why you're interested in our program, and the why major essay. Because a lot of the questions in the interview process, the alumni that ask you or the or the admissions officer, they'll ask you questions that you've already written about in your essays. So I think if you start the essays first, finalize that, and then go into the interview process, it's gonna be much easier for you to answer those questions. Because a lot of my students who come to me, I'll ask them, okay, why are you interested in Brown? Why are you interested in NYU? Or interested in Penn State? And oftentimes they can't tell me why, right? They'll tell me that it's a great school because it's ranked four or ranked 15, or it's located in this area, but that's not good enough in order to really tell me why you're interested in that program. We need um, things that you should focus on will be um, resources that they have to offer, professors like Katie set up before, um, any type of internship opportunities that they have. Once you have that, that list of things, two to three different things that you can really draw from and how you can really utilize those resources in the school, then that interview process and the essays become much, much easier in that, in that, in that regard. So really understanding our school, for starting with the essays and then going into interview is, is a good approach here. Um, okay, so how we plan our essay one more, we can, we can sort of um, skip that and move on from there, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I think you, you covered the other points. Yeah. Early. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank okay, you. So, Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I went a little fast. I'm sorry, but <laughs> we do want to get Q and A as, as much as possible. Yeah, I think that was a great example of 
you know, taking someone and working with that, right? Like we're not just providing right. advice, we're, we're making sure that students are positioning themselves yeah. in the best possible place for these opportunities. So I appreciate that you were able right. to, to show how we do that. I don't think it's too easy to do. Um, so yeah, how can Illumin help? There's a lot of different ways that we'll just leave up here on the screen while we do Q and A. Yeah, definitely. I think we just had a couple of questions, but of course, feel free if you have anything else. I know we've talked about a lot of different things today, so uh, definitely put it in chat, put it in Q&A, right? Um, just a question about like the supplemental essays of John, how you're talking about uh, diving in and really being able to dissect and see how the uh, essays line up. Uh, I guess the question was saying like, where do you search up this information? Uh, is there a particular portal uh, or do you just have to create the common app application or the you have to show your interest in the school, fill out the info, then just look at the prompts there. Yeah, I would. I, I think the, the the best way moving forward is to create your Common App application, add those schools in, and answer answer for the school list for this particular school. Answer those questions of the application, like what major you're interested in, what program or what department do you want to apply for? Do you want to do EDEA? Once you answer those questions, um, some because sometimes a school might ask you a particular set of questions. They will have in in that category in the Common App. They'll have different sort of categories. One of them is essays, right? And you can just click on writing, and it will show you an entire list of those different questions. But sometimes they don't show reveal all of the questions that you might be interested in because if you all of a sudden click engineering a different set of questions might pop up right if you click uh, sociology a different set of questions also pop up so doing going through the common app first i think is a good sort of approach there yeah definitely got to be really careful um yeah like John just said, clicking different buttons picks up different things. Um, at Cornell, just as an example, there's the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Hotel, the College of Engineering. Mm -hmm. Depending on the college you select, it's a different prompt. Um, so it's important to plan ahead, basically. Um, and yeah, you can find all of this by just adding the schools on Common App. Common App also has a site. I'm going to link you to it, but for some reason, it's saying it's not updated yet for 20, I guess, the class of 2022 um but here so eventually you will be able to search a school here and see see the writing requirements for it if it's on coalition it's a bit more difficult you do have to finish the profile section before you can get into the individual um, colleges requirements most of the time so in that case i would just go to the like ut austin and UW are like are the really big schools on coalition and they're really transparent about their essay prompts on their their websites um, and then a question about ED, asking if you could do ED2 without applying ED1 if UCs are one of your top choices. I don't believe it works that way, right? Because yeah, so I, yeah, uh, if UC is one of your top choices, you still won't hear your results back before you have to do the ED2. So mm -hmm. it's not really gonna help you. So if you get in on the ED2, it'll be February. Your, your, your UC results aren't gonna come out till March. So you'll still have to withdraw your UC application. Mm -hmm. um, so if UC is a top choice for you, don't, don't do either of those programs. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll lose out on UC um, just because of the way the timeline works. You have to you have to commit to attend on ED and you have to withdraw all pending applications when you're accepted. And then just another more generic question. I think that'll be helpful for a lot of students. And sorry, we're just running out of time today. But um, what is the best way to research uh, a type uh, of school that a particular student is looking for? Like, how would you say like, oh, if a student is interested in flexibility around their major, or as you were saying, kind of the uh, internships and job opportunities, how would you recommend students kind of uh, dive into that a bit more? Um, yeah, so one, the first thing that you can do is really just go, to, just really understand the school's sort of philosophy and what type of students they're looking for. Just go on a website and check the about us section. They'll tell you um, their history, um, the type of environment. So for example, UPenn, I'm using that because that's an example we just reviewed. They're looking for close-knit community. They're looking for innovation and entrepreneurship, right? So if you can highlight that in your application, then that's going to be better for you, right? Whereas if you are if you don't have really have that in your, in your application, it's going to make it's going to be for a harder case to, in order to convince them that you are the a best type of student for that campus. Um, other, other sort of um, ways to understand what type of internship the opportunities they that they have is if you go to the school website, 
they have different categories, right? So they have sort of student life campus, right? They'll have um, student activities, they'll have courses. Going through each one and really understanding, okay, oh, the school has this type of community service, that school has that type of sort of volunteer opportunity. Then you start to get a good sense of what type of school, what type of students the school is looking for. For example, Brown University, they have an open curriculum, meaning they really encourage students to try different disciplines. Right. Um, so perhaps really perhaps a, a student who's undeclared or a student who has many different interests is a great fit for Brown. Right. So um, really understanding schools, a teaching philosophy is, is a good way, a good approach there. And then there's, of course, like as, as John was talking about, like working backwards from what the school is looking for. But yeah. Katie also mentioned this idea of uh, looking at the school list for if you have something more specific like. Uh, I don't know, like opportunities to study abroad or opportunities for yeah. a job placement, right? You might be able to find a list uh, going in that direction as well. And I think Katie's also just final, uh, putting some final <laughs> comments in uh, for that last few questions, but uh, do want to say, hey, really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, hopefully we we're able to talk. Uh, I, I know that we went through pretty quickly, so we'll post a recording of this and you'll be able to also look through uh, the info from today. Um, but want to thank Katie, John, for joining us this morning and stay posted. We'll also be doing a webinar on the UC essays pretty soon. Okay. Yay. All right. Thanks, Thanks so much for joining us. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.